Welcome to this evening's edition of the How Have I Not Read This book club. Uh, my name is James Meter with Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group, part of Penguin Random House. Now, uh, I know you did not tune in to see me this evening, but if you'll bear with me, I have just a couple housekeeping items to touch on before I introduce our speakers and turn the next hour over to them and to you with your questions. Uh, our book selling partner for this event is Brooklyn's Greenlight Bookstore. We hope if you don't already have a copy of Station Eleven or indeed any of Emily or Patrick or Isaac's books that uh, you might think about ordering copies from Greenlight. And with holiday gift giving upon us, even if you have a copy, you might consider buying something for another reader in your life. Greenlight does have signed copies of Station Eleven, and if they run out, she will stop in and get more. Um, and it's perfect for gift giving. So there, I have said that. Next, if you'd like to submit questions for our speakers, and we really hope you will, you can do so by using the Q&A module, which should be available at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote questions submitted by others. Uh, just activate the Zoom chat, which should also be at the bottom of your screen, and comment along with the conversation. We suggest toggling your chat from all panelists, which is the default to all panelists and attendees which will make your comments available to the whole group and maybe get some conversation going. So now, okay, with that out of the way, I'm here to ask our speakers to start their microphones and cameras, come onto the digital stage. And while they get settled, I'd like to introduce this evening's moderator, who will then introduce Emily and Patrick and get down to the program. And I will go away. Uh, you've seen our moderator, Isaac Fitzgerald, recommending books on the Today Show. He's also been a firefighter, worked on a boat, and he was once given a sword by a king, thereby accomplishing three out of the five of his childhood goals. And I really want to know what the other two are, Isaac. Uh, Isaac now spends most of his time writing and is the author of the national best-selling children's book, How to Be a Pirate, and has an essay collection coming out next year, Dirtbag, Massachusetts, which, by the way, you can pre-order now. I would suggest by Greenlight. Isaac, I turn it over to you. I can't wait to hear the conversation. All right, thank you so much, James. I'm just gonna clap because I believe uh, even though that we're in Zoom sessions, we should all clap. Uh, and now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce, of course, both Emily and Patrick. And I'm so excited to be here. I absolutely love this book and I absolutely now love this show. Uh, so Emily St. John Mandel's sixth novel, Sea of Tranquility, will be published in April of 2022. Her previous novels include The Glass Hotel, which was selected by President Barack Obama as one of his favorite books of 2020, was shortlisted for the Scotia Bank Giller Prize, and has been translated into 21 languages. And, of course, the author of Station Eleven, which was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award, won the 2015 Arthur C. Clarke Award and has been translated into 33 languages. Station Eleven will premiere December 16th as a Max original limited series on HBO Max. She lives in New York City with her husband and daughter. I've heard maybe her daughter will make an appearance tonight. You never know. And on to our next, Patrick Somerville is a novelist and screenwriter. He developed and show ran Station Eleven for HBO Max and did such a tremendous job, I might add, and also created, wrote, and executive produced the critically acclaimed Netflix series, Maniac. He previously served as writer, producer for the HBO drama, The Leftovers, and his books include two collections of stories, Trouble in 2006, and The Universe in Miniature in, Miniature in 2010, and two novels, The Cradle in uh, 2009, and This Bright River in 2012. He lives in LA with his wife and three kids. Thank you so much, Patrick and Emily. How hey. y'all doing? Hey, thank you so Hi, much everyone. for doing this, Isaac. Oh, it's my tremendous pleasure because I got free screeners of the show and I loved it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Congratulations. And I'm not alone in that, but we'll get to that in a moment. I wanted to, one, again, encourage anyone in the audience, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them towards the end. But I really wanted to open with this, not to sound like a creep, but it's no secret that I absolutely love Station Eleven, the book. Um, and I know that it sold, the rights kind of sold a while back, right? So I was wondering if you could kind of talk us through the development process, maybe Emily starting with you and then moving Yeah, on. I wanna hear Emily's version. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, Patrick probably knows much more about this than I do, but um, 
Yeah. At my book party for station 11 in 2014, I got an email that there was an offer for, I think they were calling it film rights back then. It took a while for it to turn into a TV show um, from a production company that I hadn't heard of because I wasn't super familiar with that world. Um, And, you know, it sounded great. I optioned the book and then years went by and it, uh, yeah, it just didn't quite seem to come together, um, which was fine because every 18 months I get an option payment, which was nice. Uh, no effort on my part. And then, Patrick, how did it get to Paramount? Was that you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was me. And I, but I think a lot of authors know this thing, this feeling too, which is Hollywood comes calling and it's like a random name in a random production company. And it's like, I'm, it's, it's, I'm done. I'm I have, I don't have to work the rest of my life. All my movie or all my books are going to be movies. And, and then time goes on and it kind of nothing happens and then nothing happens. And then you get disappointed because there's no information. So on my side of this, I, Emily and I really, we had read once together um, and not uh, for station 11, but your previous novel. And I was reading the paperback of this bright river and four people came to our reading. Right. which doubled the size of the crowd probably Pretty good. I've gotten on my own so yeah, yeah. well you're right same for me yeah exactly. yeah right, right. mid-list author flyover state uh just trying to make it work but we we became friends on that trip and also sort of talked about the weird thing about doing well enough to have your books be coming out but not well enough to be able to you know like have a family or yeah. pay rent or take care of a kid so I then, that was 2012, I, I was wanting to get to TV and Emily said, well, I'm, I'm working on something new. I'm just going to try this one and kind of see how it goes. And two years later, I was in my first writer's room uh, in Los Angeles, a show called The Bridge on FX. And uh, I heard that there was a smash hit of an amazing novel coming out uh, that had just come out called Station Eleven. And I was like, oh yeah, one more. And I loved it. I loved the book so much. And I heard about the option too, because I, I was not, not in a position at that time to go get a big book and pitch it and develop. I didn't, I wouldn't have known how to, but I heard the same thing about the movie and that didn't feel quite right because all of us who love station 11 know it's not that it's long exactly. It's that there's a, there are so many people to care about and there, and there are so many what feel like sketches of characters that are not, that are three-dimensional characters that you somehow rendered in a page. And then there's so many timelines and then there's so many points of interest thematically. And then there's Emily's voice as an author that sort of binds it all together. It seemed very difficult to do that in a film because you would probably have to pick one thing and abandon everything else. And I thought uh, a limited series sounded better, but as I said, that was <clears throat> a long time ago. Wonderfully, the development hell happens once in a while. Uh, and so the people trying to get it done tried and tried and tried and didn't. And I got an opportunity when I was finishing up Maniac, I heard that the movie was just not going to happen. But the rights owner, the same person who emailed Emily long before, was not knowing what to do. And by then, when it, you know I was making Maniac, by then I can call someone up and say like, hey, you want to you want to hear what I have to say about this? And I went and his, it was a producer named Scott Steindorf. Uh, and I came in and I said, I don't think this is a sci-fi story. And I don't think this is a comic book story. I think this is about humanism. And I think that you need to do this with, with 10 episodes. And I think you need to capture what Emily did with time travel through emotion not uh, Chirons <laughs> or whatever. I, I pitched my pitch and Scott loved it. And we took it to Paramount and they loved it. And we started the process of developing it as a TV show. That's incredible. So Patrick, you, but you were a hundred percent like a fan. You were familiar with the book. Loved it. To jump back in time, just a little bit there, something you kind of touched on quickly was, you know, you an author yourself, uh, but you were starting to work in the write, writing room, starting to break into Hollywood. How, how does that transition happen? You kind of skipped over it kind of easily there. How do you go from per- someone in the writer's room to like, oh, hey, I want to make this book happen. I want to turn it into a show and people pick up the phone. To a creator, I guess. I, I think when you're a novelist, you are a creator uh, and you you have earned it. Anyone who's written a book, and you know this too, Isaac, it's, it's hard and you pay dues, but 
you do it alone. You learn, you teach yourself the skill, you make the tool you need to make the book along the way, something like that. But a lot of times I think when novelists come to work in TV, you think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, you know, like, and you just like, well, I know how to do a book because I did a, or I can do this story, I'm a novel, but it takes a little, a time, you know, you're, there are things I just didn't, wasn't good at at all in TV writing. I didn't know I wasn't, and it took a couple of years. So I think part of my answer is just paying dues and learning how to be a screenwriter instead of a novelist, meeting people, seeing how to pitch, developing the part of your brain that would translate visual or, or, or novel into visual storytelling. I had the very lucky experience of being in the writer's room with Tom Parada and Damon Lindelof. Uh, it's very unusual for Tom to be in the room as they were adapting his novel, The Leftovers. So you'd see kind of the forces of TV and the forces of a literary novelist literally in conversation about let's do this instead. And, you know, that's not in the book. And then, but Tom being like, that's kind of cool, you know, or Damon remembering, actually, let's remember that line from your book about the goats. That's my favorite line. Can we bring the goats back? And so I watched adaptation happen in real time in a way that those, those couple of years at Leftovers, I think taught me how to know what I would do if I got a chance. And then Maniac gave me the chance to have a loud enough voice to say, this is what I want to do. That's incredible. And Emily, can I ask, how did it feel on your end? Because, so, you, you know, you get that email literally at the launch party, then you're stuck there for a little bit, bit of while. Like, what did it mean that Patrick was coming on? I, I was not aware that y'all had actually done a reading together. What a bonding experience. Four people. To have one of those four person readings. Four like, people, that's right. Yeah, what did you <laughs> and, and then to hear that it was transitioning into a TV show. No, it was... I think I, I think as a sort of coping mechanism, which I'm sure a lot of novelists do this, I'd kind of convinced myself that the idea that it would ever turn into anything was completely imaginary and just really not ever going to happen. But, you know, great that option checks come in, really appreciate it. Um, obviously, this thing will never hit the screen because that is usually the case. Uh, most people I know who've optioned books, that's what happened. Um, no, it was extraordinary. Um, not only that all of a sudden it was actually getting made, which is amazing. Um, that it was getting made by somebody I like and trust and respect. Like that, that felt like hitting a kind of adaptation jackpot to me. So yeah, it's uh, it was amazing and kind of unexpected. That's incredible. And then again, the final product is quite extraordinary. Um, I, I wanted to ask real quick, the timing. I mean, watch, I, it's very easy to get moved to tears about the subject matter with, well, being honest, there's a lot of humor in there as well, but we'll get to that. Like, was there a feeling that now was the time to make this show uh, or was it in progress already when the pandemic hit? Oh no, I, we're, I think a gigantic group of artists and makers who never in a thousand years would have signed up for a project about a pandemic after a pandemic started. And I, I think that's what somehow makes it exceptional or it, not exceptional, that's what made it work. I think uh, Hero and I started talking about the adaptation in, in February of 2019. And we shot uh, episodes one and three in January and in February of, of 2020 before the pandemic. So our writer's room did an entire 20 week push through the adaptation before we'd ever heard the words COVID-19. We just because of Emily's book being what it is, it, it was interesting to both of us because we wanted to try to invert the, the post-apocalyptic genre. The pit, when we went around to pitching, the pitch was, we wanna make a post-apocalyptic show about joy. Or another thing I said in all those rooms was, if 8 billion people die between episodes one and two, what you owe story-wise is life and happiness and joy and, rebuild we would no one wanted to investigate pain more or as hero called it i think people say this all the time is pain porn that genre exploits a thing but emily's novel refused to do that so radically that like i i thought that no one maybe had ever written the, a post-apocalyptic novel until station 11. it was sort of like the idea was kind of there and emily then really saw what the right idea was. And that's the, that's the profundity deep down in that book. Like 
I didn't know why, but but traveling symphony group Shakespeare music celebrity <laughs> pandemic, but kind of not not very much violence and not very much pain. <clears throat> Emily found a formula I think that no one had before, and then uh, that's why the opportunity to make a show out of it felt so exciting to me and and to Euro. Mariah, our director, to the actors who signed on, to all of our heads of department who eventually made the world with us. But we didn't know what was coming either. We just kept going after it happened. I mean, this again, I'm, I'm saying so far away from spoilers because debuting soon. Uh, but just to know that you shot that first episode and the third episode before. Oh, man. I mean, it was so weird. The, there, the gas, it's not a spoiler yeah. in any way, but there is a room full of kids wearing masks. That's all I'm going to say. Like, yeah. holy smokes. But so, Emily, for you, like, so here it is, this dream that you did not think was possible, because I hear you 100% on that. The fact of the matter is, is a lot of stories get optioned. A lot of things go into that pipeline, and they maybe don't come out the other end. But here you are. It's actually happening with somebody you trust. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic hit. Can you walk us through a little bit about those highs and lows, what that felt like? Or did you always kind of know it was going to come through on the other side? Um, no one knew anything. <laughs> Speaking for, maybe I should just say that for myself. Yeah, it, the spring of 2020 was just so bad. Um, you yeah. know, my pandemic was so isolating for the most part, like most people's. What, what I will say is that when production resumed, which I want to say, Patrick, was that the summer of 2020 when you guys started shooting again or later? Oh, no, we didn't know where we would be still then. We right. we made the choice because you remember the, we did the election feeling uh, around July, we didn't know who would win. But, and that, that was very tied, I think, for all of us in the sense of whether the United States would be a science embracing um, nation or not for the next four years. So we had some data and Chicago had, I think 70,000 active COVID cases in July and uh, Ontario, the entire province had 120. Um, <laughs> it's a no brainer. It's really, it was really scary to imagine my, uh, my job was to keep 300 people safe making a show. And it was hard to imagine how to do that uh, in Chicago at that time. And so we made the choice to go to Toronto around because it was the Great Lakes region essentially that's what made it feel okay that it was the same place it was the same woods the same lakes mm -hmm. we were shooting Lake Michigan but we could shoot Lake Ontario for Lake Michigan and it, it felt fair to me as someone who grew up on Lake Michigan um so we didn't get on the grounds until October and I didn't get on the ground until January and we didn't roll until February uh of this year February 2021. That's amazing. No, because what, what I was going to say is just um, the, the, the realization and idea that there were, as you say, 300 people who were engaged in this pretty intense experience of Station Eleven, which had nothing to do with me. It's just like this thing happening in Canada. Um, that was so moving to me. It was just, it was something I thought about all the time, you know, during those months of production. And yeah, it was, the whole thing's been extraordinary, but that, that was something that I found particularly moving as the, as the production unfolded. It did have something to do with you. Well, yeah, uh, but like, I wasn't there. You like, I mean, I mean yeah, world yeah, yeah. Really you know what I mean. <laughs> and we wanted to build out because we loved it so much. Right, but. And we were thinking of you the whole time. And well, it's nice. Read, I was, I was thinking of you. the book on set all the time too. And I was always having to be like, no, that's in the book. It's not in the script. That's the book. Please read the script. No, just a little <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> well, but did, did you did you feel that way, Emily? Does it feel that way? Like you're giving, you're basically saying, here's my story. This is the source material. And you do have to have that trust to, to see what comes out on the other end, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this will sound paradoxical, but you know, on the one hand, I always really cared about the production and it matters to me that it's so good. Uh on the other hand, I always undersea, uh, undersea appearance. Undersea appearance. <laughs> uh, this is my daughter Cassia. Come to say goodnight. I love you like crazy. Hi, Cassia. This Hi. is Isaac. He's saying hi. You've seen Isaac on Zoom before. We've done this before. We've done this before. We crashed. I, can't. I know. I've got the headphones. I there is no before. <laughs> oh, you can hang that on the tree. I'll give that to you to take upstairs. Okay. All right. Cassie, I hear you're turning six soon. Good luck. 
This was, by the way, every production meeting, the entire shoot. Uh, where yeah. we, we were in Zooms and people's kids were wandering by, including mine, naked in the background as we we're trying to work out this or that for episodes. Like we all lived that life, this life that everybody on the, uh, who's listening knows too while we were making it. Yeah, I, I kind of liked that about 2020. You got these glimpses into people's lives. Um, yeah, the, uh, right, the paradox <laughs> where on the one hand, I really cared about the show. On the other hand, I do feel like you need to be kind of detached, mm. you know, just in the sense of when you sell those rights, they're sold, like they're not yours anymore. Somebody's going to go and do something that, that might differ from the source material. And that's what the shift between mediums requires. So yeah, this, this weird combination of deeply caring, but also detachment. Yeah, I understood completely. Can you walk us through though? Uh, so there's deeply caring, there's de detachment. And then you actually do get to see these characters who, you know, you've written other books since this has come out. You've got a new one coming out next year. What was it like to see your work from, from years ago live on the screen? What did it mean to revisit these characters for you? It was so moving to me. Um, yeah, I'll get choked up talking about it. No, for, for me, the thing, you know, you imagine these characters um, maybe one thing about that was good about not having been able to visit the set just because of COVID is I never saw behind the scenes. I just saw the magic that everybody sees when they watch those 10 episodes, which is immersive. And yeah, just seeing that world brought to life is extraordinary. I, I spent so much time imagining, you know, try, going down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out details like, um, you know, the caravans that the symphony uses, uh, what that actually looks like, how many horses you have, and then just seeing that caravan go by across Six the screen. Wagons, yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Well, I mean, but the funny thing about like the way, like Ruth Emin, our production designer, the, this is a many, many, many months long uh, op operation of design uh, that rendered in Unreal Engine first. Uh, I think she started at 12. Uh, I think we had to pare it back, but Ruth had to, I think when you write a novel, uh, you don't have to do the physics of how the three major wagons lock together. And then there's the lazy Susan in the center that can spin the set to get two sets out of it. And then how the yoke, or like we had a horse guy, we had a wrangler who uh, he half of the people riding the horses in the show are wranglers from our horse guy dressed as traveling symphony members because <laughs> these that. things were so intense and um it took an hour to reset the symphony to go in a big circle to go back and do another take of them coming into town and like just the raw logistics of of building the wagon train uh were thousands of hours of collective work um and and they open and they're real and the instruments are all in them. This, they become the stage. We shoot on them. People ride them. They're a huge part of the show. And it was kind of Ruth's masterpiece. Um, I could always see it when I read your book. But my God, what it took to make it and make it work. <laughs> Don't doubt it. I spent so it, much time right. Googling like the weight of extended bed Ford pickup trucks with the engine removed. Trying to figure so out how, how big the, the wheels have to be. The you took the engines out, yeah. Yeah, obviously. Had how to. Big did, right. And like how many horses per vehicle. And Four, six, yeah, yeah. Two, and eventually I, I didn't spend, right. I didn't <laughs> spend a thousand hours on it. I was like, I, I don't know. I'm just not going to spend it. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank God for art departments. Yeah. And this, I think too, Isaac, back to the first thing you were saying, like the joy of collective art making uh, is that you can, you have enough people and enough minds and enough kinds of expertise to, to do all of it and take the blueprint from the, the novel and make it real. And I, I think the joy of writing a novel is you, you're allowed to stop at some point if you cross the threshold of believability. You don't need to write the sentences, but, but it was, it's amazing to, to live on both sides of the line and see, see how much work goes into it on right. both sides. All right, I'm sorry, I just, incredibly charmed by that back and forth that you both had was there was there text connection was there were you all in touch a little bit throughout this or like how was it more like hang on 
let me go out into the wilderness and I'll come back with the Bible. Now and then, there were important things I I, I, I wanted Emily's blessing on uh, ch about changes. And then like now and then I'd like send her a weird video of us testing the wagons or right. did I ever send you the video of the kid in the parking lot with the six? Yeah, uh, and like uh, every video class. Because we'd yeah. have to be like, can, can you actually do that? So we have to send a PA out into the snow and try to push six carts full <laughs> to see if that's actually possible for right. one person to do it. And I would send her the, the test videos just so she knew her world was slowly coming to life. But I, I think I sprinkled them. You didn't want to know, you didn't want to know the problems. You, I think just right. a, couple, a couple little sprinkles now and then. Yeah, and I'd watch each three second video clip like 87 times and just this glimpse <laughs> into, into the production. But were you, Emily, were you like, but don't let me know if things are going wrong? She didn't no, even say that. No, that I didn't say that. Yeah. yeah, I knew. <laughs> I was like, I'm just not going. I was not going to send Emily a problem. <laughs> well, all right, but that's not to now. Now that we are on the other side of it, and people will get to experience it soon. Um, you know, you you mentioned that there was a lot of Zoom talks as well. Like, what were the hardships of shooting during a pandemic? Or, or, or to put it differently, did the show change in any way because you were shooting during a pandemic? I think I would probably be full of shit if I said no, but because we changed, you know, like we lived a year of a new kind of life. And I think that changed me and us. And, and then you, I got to add to that things like um, 25 high level producers and HODs who are part of the brain trust have to leave their families to go to Toronto and aren't allowed to leave because of quarantine uh, and go back and visit home. Um, or we had to leave our crew behind in Chicago and build a new one of strangers who wore masks all day, whose faces we never saw, but we were making like a collective thing out of love together, but getting to know each other. Um, but at the same time, it didn't change as much as you would think because we never re recalibrated based on COVID. We never changed the conceptual idea because I think we had the right one. We, a post-apocalyptic show about joy. Uh, what if we background what horrifying versions like The Road do, we make that the background and look at the kinds of relationships that help people survive. Um, the moments of ingenuity that help people rebuild. The, the moments of community where music and art uh, healed people actually. You know, like we say that in like the lit fiction community too. Like I, like I can just so hear myself saying that at AWP 2011, you know, like art heals. And like, and I can, you know what I mean? I can so see everyone kind of going like this. And then the, I can so feel like, I don't believe this at all and neither do they, or I do and we do, but nobody does, you know, like art, is in a different um, position in like late capitalism than, than it is in our show. And it's actually true if there's this, a bit of a, a absence of, of it, if it's rare and special and exceptional and being performed by people who are suffering through trauma too and making something coherent. So it was, it was, it wasn't a different project once we came back. It was a year later, but I think I think we were leaning in probably more toward how we've changed. I don't know. I'm more vulnerable than I used to be, or I'm more something. And I think I think that's in the show. I think it's 100% in the show. Storytelling, uh, also acting within the acting is so incredible. You know, to start it on a stage, but it's also a novel. But you also have, you're following an act like the small child who learns how to react. Anyways, it's all there. It's all in the book. It's all in the show. Um, Emily, did you, did you, one, did you feel that when you watched, when you watched the episodes, when you first got to see them, did you see that they had maybe captured that, the storytelling, the hope, the joy in Apocalypse, uh, as Patrick's saying? And then, but also, were you worried about it beforehand? Were you worried that maybe they were going to come back with The Walking Dead? Plus the Shakespeare Company. It was a risk. No, um, but why? Yeah. Like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Right. No, I um I don't think I'd really tried to imagine beforehand what it was gonna be like. 
I hoped it would be good. I thought it would probably be good. But that tone that you just mentioned is kind of tricky. And I think the show pulls it off brilliantly and beautifully. But yeah, just trying to trying to get that sense that it is a post-apocalyptic story. It's not a horror story. It is about joy. There's so much love in the show. The show is really funny, which sounds like a crazy thing to say about a show where 8 billion people die between episodes one and two, but that it is true. Uh, no, it was just, I keep using the word extraordinary, but it really has been. Um, I also felt in a weird way, just because the pandemic at Station Eleven is so immeasurably worse than our pandemic, which is not to minimize the, you know, the misery and awfulness of the present moment in any way. It, it did make me feel better in a weird way watching it. Just, uh, you know, wow, this this could be so much worse. Is what I kept thinking. <laughs> Yeah, you know, my, my version of that, I don't, I don't think this will be that dark, but but like in the 80s when you were a kid, whenever I watched a show that like uh, the CIA uses torture to get what they need or spies, torture scenes, like the scary ones were the, the pain moments, but then some character would always come in and be like, you know, what's most effective is playing death metal at 8,000 decibels outside and sleep deprivation. And I'd always be like, come on. Like the cycle lot, like that's not bad compared to thumb screws or something like that. But for us in our pandemic, I actually think that like the, the flip side of what you just said, Emily, is that we underestimate the mental pain uh, that this one's given us uh, right. over time. I, I, like, I, I kind of feel like we don't know it yet. Like how, how, how much that we've been through because we're not allowed to say it because it's if you you didn't lose someone so you're okay you're safe but like I kind of feel like none of us have been safe for a really long time um and so it's equivalent in my head almost like our pandemic is as bad as yours uh, not because of the body count but because of what it what it does to people to not be able to be together mm -hmm. for for too long um, so like, I think it, that's my long winded way of saying that I, I actually think that ours is very dangerous now, still, still happening. Um, but it's also like, we are going to need to heal uh, a lot. And, and so, um, your book was speaking to that too. Uh, that's, that's why it felt like it worked. Okay. Like, it doesn't matter that ours is a 99.9% and the, or the leftovers was more like our numbers now it's bad when it, when when something like this happens and we have to we have to come together i think to be okay again i i think that i emily were you about to say something i just want i don't want mm -hmm. to I, I do want to say though because one i i almost agree like i i agree with that that feeling that i had while watching of course acknowledging the pandemic that we're in right now and, and and what it took from us right in the last year and then i also did have this feeling of like oh this also like you're watching planes fall from the sky again no spoilers but what what really stood out to me is is emily something you just touched on which is the humor that was still woven through on this story and to be honest something i think helped a lot of us maybe i'm only speaking for myself here but get through a lot like who we needed smiles like we needed like you needed to find something for me it was not to get too personal here but i found a weird water vase that i never or not water vase it's a flower vase is what it would be called i never used it in my life it's just on top I, I took to drinking water out of it throughout most and it became like a weird comfort like, okay. like i don't know i don't know it, i just like the feel of it, it felt lip, nice. like the lip of it felt good yeah exactly it, it was almost like you know if one it was just like a comfort blanket that all of a sudden I got into. But anyways, these weird moments happen. You also make room for human action and, and human humor. So I did want to ask this real quick. Uh, again, not exactly a spoiler at all. Everyone that watches episode one will understand. But just the, the quick, I just tweeted by. <laughs> was there a lot of work on getting that tone right as kind of especially once you knew that this was coming out because yeah right. you're, you're putting your finger on a really good one because <clears throat> so that whole sequence in the hospital was me at my most gallows humor 
And, and it's a bit because my dad was a doctor and I, I've heard the way, I, there's something about, and my mom's English on top of it, which did, like there's something about stoicism in the face of absolute death, uh, where people are still making jokes casually that I knew the sh it couldn't be everywhere in the show, but those, those three, I wanted, so they had, there's even more that never didn't make the cut because it was too dark, way too dark. Uh, with the, the, the things that they say to each other on their little walk and talk through there. Um, but, uh, and, and that area is one of the few that sort of, it already was so dark, it was making some of the executives <laughs> uncomfortable about the way these doctors were talking. Right. Um, but I was like, no, do this is, doctors do talk like this and see as a hero uh, and, and this is their bravery. But, but then a couple months passed and our pandemic came and I was like, yeah, we can't, that's what, that one's too much, that one's too much. But I just tweeted, can I say something, Isaac, too? I, I, we made this meet, we made the meet. I have it. I'm texting it to both of you guys today after this. My greatest, deepest, it's, it's just a cat lying on a bed going like this and it says hashtag bye. And I feel like it's so uh, deeply of the show that nothing would make me happier than if the internet had started using the tweet we made. It's in episode three. You saw it for a second when Miranda's up looking. Uh, if the tweet we made for the show turned into a tweet that people use, not, not because the world's ending, because they're saying bye, bye to somebody. That's, like, I want to reclaim it from the show. I like and that. And then make it positive again. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and put it out there in the world. Emily, how did you, like, I, it's in the book too, though, right? There's this joy, this, there's this through line. Did you feel like they really hit those tones right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they really did. It was, yeah, I, I, all I can do is just keep repeating how much I love this show. But yeah, they, they absolutely well, did. you have did. a favorite, other than I, I stole the I tweeted by, but did you have like a favorite moment of, I have a favorite moment, but it's not till episode three. Like, I don't want to spoil the dialogue. One, two, it's three really... are all, one, two, three are all coming oh, okay, out on okay. Thursday. I feel like you can do it. Okay, did, well, did some what? media if... person tell you don't do it? They did, <laughs> but you know what? Um, I'm overriding. I wrote the book. It's fine. Go run or um, override. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, if the world doesn't end, your half of the pitch isn't there yet. No, it's if we don't all die, your half of the pitch isn't there yet. It, it's amazing. <laughs> Well, they're still at work. We everyone was still at work. We're like, yeah, well, what are we exactly. supposed to do? Go to work or go home right. and make the barricade? Uh, it, we that was why March thirteenth was so awful. I was I didn't yeah. know what to be. No one. Yeah, did. exactly. Yeah, for me it was March twelfth. Like I dropped my daughter off at school in the morning, and then in the afternoon it was like, what am I doing? Now I went back and got her. Uh, yeah, that week was insane. Hard days. Yeah, and it, and it is. I think I think that's what makes the show. So incredible. And, and, and Emily, this is going to be kind of almost a final question to you, because also the book's so incredible. You had this mm -hmm. surreal experience of your book came out in April. For the record, not Station 11, The Glass Hotel, right. another wonderful novel. Quick plug for everyone. If Thank you, you haven't read it yet. Fantastic. Read book. Thanks. Um, Miranda's in it, too. She yeah. is. I love her. Yeah. And totally. so I wanted to I wanted to ask, like, you had the surreal experience of everyone talking about your book once this happened and now everyone's going to be talking about the show and how almost it seems quickly that it is in response but it's incredible to know that it was in production before um what has that process been like have you changed how you feel about that you and i did an event in april of 2020 it was march it was, it was like right as it was breaking yeah. um yeah, that was the week when I was canceling my book tour, like week by week, city by city. Like, yeah, I don't know why we thought the world might be back by mid-April, but we somehow mm. <laughs> did. Oh, you know, crazy optimism of those days. Um, it was too much to, to, yeah, you couldn't, to incorporate, actually, the truth. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm sure we all had moments like this. I remember saying to my husband when we were just first went into lockdown, you know what? I could live like this for six months and like feeling super brave and stoic. Like, you know, here we are two years later. Um, yeah. At, at first I really re I really tried not to talk about the pandemic because it was a weird time where I was getting all of these requests for op-eds and articles about the weirdness of having written station 11 as a real life pandemic breaks out. And it felt kind of uncomfortable to talk about like I was using the pandemic to, um, to sell copies of station 11, you know? So I felt like that, that felt strange. Um, so yeah, I held that line for about a week of zoom events <laughs> and 
it was what people wanted to talk about. And I, I surrendered pretty quickly. Um, when I look back at that time, we just were so desperate for connection and we still are. But what I remember of the spring of 2020 is that Zoom really meant a lot. You know, that was really the only time you saw people who you weren't married to or trying to homeschool. And it kind of meant where, everything. It's where you would go to laugh. Yeah, exactly. I didn't laugh yeah. at home uh, because it was too hard. But I laughed when I saw my friends uh, like playing whatever code word, whatever those games were. That we were <laughs> right, <playing>. right. <laughs> yeah, like I thought that virtual events would be really creepy and weird and distanced in that cold technological way. But getting to talk to people about books is nice. Um, yeah, I can't remember where I was going with this question. <laughs> well, well, you know what I'm thinking though, Emily, because mm -hmm. your book, I always thought it was about the internet. And this is what I said when I went to go pitch the guy. I, you, oddly, I thought you were trying to jolt us into realizing how amazing it is instead of doing the other thing we always do, which is it's dehumanizing and silos us and fractures us that like, by the way, we inadvertently invented the most amazing thing we've ever invented and it saved us. You know, yes, it also has now created all sorts of problems with the way our culture works, but um, we would have been all alone, uh, right. I think, for a really long time. And, and we weren't because of it. So the show too, just like the book, the nostalgia for the internet in year 20 was so loving looking back on it. Uh, and we tried to always kind of make the internet suck in the before, but make it a beautiful old, old uh, magical thing that kids, right. kids ask questions about in the after. And I think we should reassess our relationship to it because I think it's beautiful. Um, and it's, it's horrible too, but you don't hear a lot about how it's beautiful without sounding like a skeezy tech bro. Right, <laughs> like right. Like an out of date but skeezy an tech an bro, like the 90s. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, it's true. I mean, the original project of Station Eleven was to write about people in a post technological world. You now, the pandemic was an incidental way to end the world. How you like, got to the story you wanted yeah, to Yeah, exactly. You just, you know, because if you're going to a post technological place, you got to get from point A to point B. So, that was the only purpose of the pandemic. So, Except it's not a post-technological novel. They invent wagons that solve their problem. And they, there's new technology to solve problems in your novel. Right. Sort of but like, the internet's gone, to your point. <laughs> the, the internet yeah. is gone. I, but the new, new, new ideas keep coming. I think that's what's amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Human keeps going. I mean, that's humanity keeps going is such a central theme to the novel. And even like, and the show for sure, just you have this, it's somebody dealing with whatever the new information is in each moment and then keeping it going in this kind of beautiful and incredible and, and wildly humane way. Real quick, I'm going to get to everyone's questions here from the audience. And I just want to encourage people just so you know, I'm pretty sure you have the option to like vote questions up or down. If there's Ooh, a question don't, there, don't that, write a bad question. They'll get downvoted. <laughs> that, that, that tweets to you. So we all go um, over to the Q&A. But no, and Emily, just so you know, you're like, I didn't know where I was going. You answered it perfectly. It was kind of like what it okay. is like having this, this book, this story that kind of everybody talked about throughout what we just experienced. The last thing I want to say, you all have done a beautiful job talking to one another, but like we don't have to dwell on it too much, but the feedback is coming back on the show. It is very positive. People are incredibly excited. I have seen episodes myself and I'm floored. I absolutely love it. Um, and so I'm not going to ask you how that feels. I'm going to ask, do you two have something to say to one another? Is there something that you two would want to talk? You know, you've already talked to each other so much throughout this, but is there something you'd want to share with one another or say to one another right now, right before the launch of this show? I totally have something. Thank you for... Um doing a reading with a stranger and letting him pick you up at O'Hare and spending a day with a person you didn't know um, because we had no plan uh, at all. We just were sort of living our lives, but you said yes to a stranger uh, and my life changed because of it. Thank you. Thank you for being the one who picked me up at O'Hare. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed my life too. I drove and your ass all around Chicago. You did. We went to a gun show. It's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. 
No, you can't turn um, up the gun show at 748. Like, oh. <laughs> okay, it somebody just, should ask yeah. about the gun show then. I wrote um, an article. It's back there. Yeah. It's in GQ somewhere. Yeah, if you Google Patrick's name plus gun show, I assume it'll come up. We um, went to one together as strangers. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, yeah, Patrick, thank you. I'm just, I'm so grateful for what you and your colleagues did on this show. I think it's extraordinary. It was a really, it was a, it was a whole, it was an adaptation made with a lot of love with a lot of people. And it started with Emily's amazing ideas and went from there. So it's hard to get, it's hard to get a, an amazing, this big and this successful and this kind of loving of a collaboration in a lifetime. Um, so I'm just grateful. And that is what I'm gonna say, cause I can say the quiet parts loud. Uh, it is a rarity that a book is adapted and it captures the spirit. But, but in the episodes that I have seen, and as a huge fan of the novel. You were skeptical. Were, you were skeptical. I, listen, you're not, listen, Patrick, you wanna put me to the board on that? You're right, you're absolutely right. You're, there's a lot of characters. Like you said, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of jumping around. I was, you're absolutely right, Patrick. It was I, hard. Was, <laughs> I was absolutely skeptical, but y'all did it. Y'all captured it. And, and I'm really excited for everybody involved. But with that, I'm gonna just give a quick clap to both of you. Oh, nice you. Job. And now I'm gonna to get to these audience questions and we're gonna start with Louis Young. Or Louise Young, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, this one's for you, Emily, just real quick, right out of the gate. Is there a reading order for your books? I'm asking, and Patrick, you touched on this real quick. I'm asking because you confirmed your books are all connected. Uh, there's no reading order. They all stand completely alone. Um, and the connections, like they're not incidental, but you definitely don't need to have read The Glass Hotel to read Station Eleven. Um, often they're quite small. You know, a character in The Glass Hotel gets a passing mention, The Singer's Gun, that kind of thing. So, yeah, no reading order. It's, yeah. It would be great if there was an interconnected set of stories and different television programs that. Many God, I, I would ones. love that. That would be so yeah. cool if you that could just run awesome. with that overlapping IP. Somebody should do that. Somebody should. Yeah. Wait, are, what, is this hypothetical, Isaac? Uh, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. Okay, okay. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna. Um, this one's for you, Patrick, uh, from Ramiro. Uh, how do you pick what to include from the novel and how do you decide, like, how to, like, what do you leave? You can't, you can't put the whole book in there. How do you, how do you make those decisions? Oh, well, don't be so sure. We, we had, I think our novel is long, or our, our show is longer than the novel, probably by, by, by our words, but I think, the the way I answer that question is that it, it was always a conceptual project like um, we had to deconstruct what felt important about the storytelling and then reconstruct in maybe more in terms of TV storytelling sometimes like drive and episodic uh, moments and, and conflict and, and build. So I think we made our choices based on um, clarity sometimes and character. So I, I think we made the choice very early to say that the two the foundations of this story are Kirsten and Jeevan um, and the before and the after. And uh, once you start saying a couple true things, uh, then you start getting the answers to, can we deal with um, Dieter? Uh, and can we deal with what happened with the suicide note or can we deal how many traveling symphony members can get named who who's an extra and who's a character like you got to start with a couple kind of core foundations and, and move outward from there and that kind of becomes your x and y axis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. that makes a lot of sense um i want to i want to ask this next question to both of you <coughs> way marge i'm going to like change your question a little bit uh because it's incredibly important uh going to adapt this question isaac yeah i'm gonna adapt this <laughs> question real quick marge i hope that's all right uh but marge asks who are the actors and how did you choose them and so i kind of want to ask patrick of course can you talk a little bit about the actors i know you've already talked so lovingly about many of them and emily i wanted to ask like what actors like really stood out to you what you're a fan of uh should i go first I'll just highlight a couple and then, and, and then Emily too, but uh, Mackenzie Davis and Himesh Patel were the first two people we hired to play uh, Kirsten and Jeevan. And they uh, are just 
artists who deeply felt and knew and engaged and just connected to the material and the story and it just all felt right 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 away and they're incredible and they 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 authored the show with us i would say matilda lawler who plays young kirsten it's very hard to find an actor uh, as young as matilda who is as incredibly nuanced talented intelligent of a reader and aware and such a pro no one treated Matilda like a kid on set because she was just one of the actors and and Mackenzie and she had a special connection they're the only people uh besides a smaller story with Tyler playing one two people playing one character and then special shout out to a couple couple people um Danny Zavato uh who not a lot of people know plays Tyler um and it was an incredibly difficult role I we made changes um, to, make, to make him a little bit, I guess, more mm, complex. Uh, everyone was traumatized. Everyone had, everyone deserved sympathy. Everyone did bad things. And Danny, uh, like Mackenzie, uh, was on a razor's edge the whole show between good guy, bad guy, and, uh, and that's hard. And then finally, Danielle Deadweiler, who plays our Miranda, the, the foundational character of, of Station Eleven, the, no, the graphic novelist. We wanted to tell the story of an artist who herself had, had suffered, but we all have seen the stories of too simple of math about how to tell an artist's life. Oh, look, traumatized, once hard in the beginning and then they made a bunch of brilliant shit. Or, oh, look, uh, self-identifies as an artist and is constantly painting and they're dedicated and that's why. But like, we all know artists want families. They fall in love, we fail, we have friends. We are shitty sometimes, but we're great and warm sometimes. We make mistakes, we fail artistically, we burn our shit down and start over. And Danielle, not only is she an incredible performer, but she's an artist herself. And this is really a breakout role for her uh, in, in a foundational role in the show. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I'm so impressed by the performances of the show. And you know what I would add to what Patrick just said? I love Lori Petty's performance. It's oh not a God. huge role, but it's uh, what it's she does big. is just phenomenal. It's, it's not not huge. It's not not huge. It's not Miranda it's or Kirsten, large. but it's it's large. Yeah. No, she was uh, she was really moving to me in that. Well, everyone, I don't know if people remember, Lori Petty was Tank Girl, uh, and, and the the star of a version of the post apocalypse that was trying to be a little punk rock, I guess, but kind of did all the all the lame things too so about about that genre, like ma over masculinize the woman to make her strong, for example. Um, and Lori, Lori's a movie star. And when I when I say that, I mean, overwhelming talent. Uh, you can feel it the second you lay eyes on her and she walks on the set and she brought us something that we needed to make the show right. And she kind of got to redo the post apocalypse a little bit. <laughs> No, she that's yeah she's fun she's an absolute phenomenal human being also was it new orange the new black which some folks might remember uh real two kind of real quick questions here um all right maybe three sapria asks to you emily is miranda in the new book um, Feel free to say, not gonna answer right no, I get confused at the overlaps i have to think it through no miranda's not in the new book but Vincent and Morella from the Glass Hotel are in the new book. And Miranda's been to the Glass Hotel. Miranda's been to the Glass Hotel, exactly. So you can think right. of the Glass Hotel as this kind of axis around which characters from three novels exist. Lovely. I love it. All right, and, and, and another one for both of you here. Uh, Jennifer asks, she says, this might be kind of a cliche question, but I love it. She, I'm just wondering, what do you both really hope people will take away from this show? Emily? You know, I've always resisted having a message with that question um, because as you know, I, I've always, I'm always asked that question in relation to Station Eleven, the novel. And my answer is always that as a reader, I really resent it when you get kind of hit over the head by the message sledgehammer, you know, when you're, you're reading the book and it's like a message comes down. Um, an idea I really like is that five people can read the same book and come away with five completely idea, different ideas about what the message is about. Um, that being said, I wouldn't describe myself as an entirely objective party on the series, but I didn't make it. Um, 
you know, I came away, I guess with, there's a message in there about the importance of art, which, you know, Patrick was bringing up the hypothetical guy at AWP talking about the, how art will save us. And like, that can sound like a cliche. That was, that was you, by the way, that was not yeah, hypothetical. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's real, you know, and the series illustrates that in a really beautiful way. So yeah, I think, I think that's, that's what I'm left with watching the series, the importance of art, the importance of love and friendship. I would just add, Isaac, uh, my hope is that if people decide they want to watch it and, and I, that's a big if, because it's a lot of feelings that are big and hard and it's okay if, if now is not the right time, but there's in some of the discourse, it's sort of like, ah, not now, bad time. But every time I think that, I, I just think the bad timing was COVID to me, for us, everything we do in response is, is to get by. And I would say like, I hope someone who didn't think that they wanted to watch this show watches it and goes away crying and, and feeling a little bit more healed and glad that they chose now to watch it. Because I, I think that we need to feel the feelings, <laughs> you know, like, and, and new stories give us ways to start feeling them. And, and I hope that someone who was saying bad timing watches it and says correct timing <laughs> at the end, because, uh, because it helped in some way to start doing, doing all the work that, that we got to do to be okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to totally speak from the heart here, which is to say, again, I, I already brought it up at the beginning uh, of this conversation, but, and again, I'm pretty sure this is absolutely no spoilers, but the first episode, there is a moment where you just hear a lot of voices and those who've already seen it know what I'm talking about. And those that don't, you'll experience it. Um, and the overwhelming emotion that I felt in that moment was untapped. Up until that moment, I was just watching the show. I don't think I was really thinking about where we are all at. Um, the fact that there was a moment then after that is maybe what really brought it all down for me. Right. And I'm saying this right now to everybody that's watching, that this show is just filled with those moments. And so I agree with you, Patrick. I really, that's why I wanted to ask right out of the gate, is this a show that you almost went into rush production because it spoke so well to the moments while to find out that you actually had already been in production with it? Because I truly think it is, it is of the moment slash what is needed in this moment, less so than uh, trying to capitalize on this moment. Uh, I don't know if I said that very articulately, but that's absolutely. I, I know you just, I just almost started crying. So I think it was quite articulate. That's, well, asshole, uh, <laughs> one for one, because that's what you did. With the show. <laughs> um, but uh, one last quick, James, I know you're here, but one last quick question, because Lisa's asking it, and I got to get to Lisa's, which is will there be a sequel to Station 11? Uh, not not to the book. Yeah, oh, yeah, Pro probably, yeah. but um, I don't know. What do you think, Patrick, from your side? I'm interested in year 25. I think that would be cool, yeah. Year 30 also seems interesting, as does year five and year 10. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. We'll see what right. happens. Right. That would be a cool thing. That was almost like you all planned it, y'all coy. Let's give them a round of applause again. It's Emily, Patrick. Thank, thank you, and Isaac, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Welcome back, James. Hey, I'm only back to say thank you to all three of you. This is amazing. This, if you work in book publishing, this is what you look forward to. This is why what you hope every day could be like. And it's not, but tonight was. Um, and a special thank you to Greenlight Bookstore of Brooklyn, which was our book selling partner here. Uh, there are signed copies of Station Eleven there. If they run out just around the corner from where Emily lives, uh, she'll go in to sign more. The holidays are coming up. Let's do this. Uh, and of course, you can buy copies of Isaac's books and Patrick's books there as well. Uh, everyone, pay them a visit, a visit. Buy good books, read good books, give them to your friends. Right. That's Thanks, what everybody. Station 11 premieres on Thursday. Patrick, Music what do you want to do? Music kills fascists. Don't, don't ever forget. I love it. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Emily, thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you to everyone. Congrats.